How's everybody? All right, turn around and wave at somebody and say good morning to them, all right? Aren't you glad finally a weekend without snow, ice, or anything? I mean, that's something to just say thankful to God for, isn't it? I mean, we've had four horrible weekends in a row that have affected churches and attendance, but I'm glad that you're here today. And as we get ready to jump into the truth of God's Word, if you go ahead and pull out your sermon notes, and uh, if you're visiting with us, welcome. Uh, we're in an apologetic series. Uh, apologetics is just a big, fancy word that means a way to defend our faith. And as our culture is shifting dramatically, I want to, in this series to give you tools of how to explain what you believe and why you believe it. So before we jump in, let's pray. God, we know that you are the author and the source of all truth. You are the truth, the way, and the life. We know, God, that unless we come through you, we have no life. Life is found in you. You are the origin of it. You are the sustainer of it. So, Lord, as we go to the truth of your word this morning, we want to be able to live in this culture, but yet explain to this culture why we know without any doubt that what we believe is the truth. Now, God, we welcome you here. We ask your presence here. In Jesus' name, amen. In this series, I've been giving you a lot of different uh, cultural worldviews, how the world view, views different things and why they believe the way they do and how we can respond to that. I summarized them down in the six cultural worldviews, if you remember. And then I gave you what was called a seventh view, a biblical worldview. And how does God say we respond and how do we live with this? And as I told you last week, you know, our culture is not evolving, it's devolving. And, and if you just watch the news, you just stay in touch, you just see that it, you, just when you think it can't get any worse, it does. And they just keep dragging us down, dragging us down, dragging us down as a nation. And that, the reason is, when 25, 30 years ago, there was an agreed upon standard of right and wrong, moral and immoral, ethical and unethical. We all agreed to this. Everybody understood this. But over the last 25 years, due to what I taught you, a term called relativism, meaning you have the right, due to personal freedom, to choose what you think is right or wrong for you, uh, what is good or bad for you, what's moral or immoral for you, what's ethical or unethical for you, that truth has gone from being a very objective, universal understanding to a very subjective you, the individual, decide what's right and what's wrong. And when a culture begins to do that, it becomes very fragmented. This is why we have so much fragmentation in America today. Everybody's taking on their own umbrella of definition of truth. And as a result of that, we're becoming more fragmented, and our country is crum crumbling as a result of that. When Adam and Eve were created, God put them in a perfect place perfect place but he gave them one rule <laughs> and that is I put this tree in the middle of the garden called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and you are not to touch it nor eat from it now I told you a couple of weeks ago how big this garden was it was all of Egypt all the way through Israel Syria Palestine Saudi Arabia Iran Iraq and Jordan that's a big garden that's a huge garden I mean, when I think of garden, I think of a few things in the backyard. I don't think of something this big. But in the middle of that, he put this tree. And every time they would see it, they knew they were not to touch it. But you know the story. The devil came to them, and they sa he said this to them in Genesis. If you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will be a what? A god. And that's where our culture is today. Our culture believes each individual is a god unto themselves. And this is why atheism is growing with such popularity, why individualism is growing with such popularity, because everybody wants to be their own god. I, I want to share with you a quote that I shared with you at the very first sermon in this series. I want to go back to this quote. Uh, there's two of them. The one is by the same guy. He was a British mathematician. He was an atheist. And when, when he made this quote, it, it explains where we are today educationally. His name is Bertram Russell. He said this, men are born ignorant, not stupid. They're made stupid by education. 
and he's right. Have you noticed the more educated we get, the more arrogant we become. The more educated we get, the more individualized we become. The more educated we get, the more we think we know it all. And as a result of this statement, it is where we are because we push our children, go to college, get a good education. But what we don't realize when we're pushing them to do this, they are buying, taking the bait that they are a God. You see, the purpose of education is to help us learn how God created the world. That's the purpose of it. And then how do we live out God's ordained, individualized purpose for our lives in the world he created? And as a result of that, if you look at all the possible knowledge there is in the universe, we know very little. And so when I think of that, that should make us humble, not egotistical. In fact, I just this week Googled, what are things that science has not figured out today? The first one, I've told you this before, is gravity. They don't know why gravity works. If you've ever been on a merry-go-round in a play yard, when you get that thing spinning, what is the natural thing that happens? You, it spins you off. We're spinning like this on this planet. We just fly off of it. They've got theories, but they don't know why. They have no clues of why gravity exists. Here's another thing they haven't figured out. What is the rest of the universe made of? They don't know. They don't know what dark energy is. They don't know what dark matter is. One scientist said this is a big perplexion. Why is there more matter than antimatter in the universe? They don't know. They don't know what black holes are and what happens inside of them. I found this one interesting. Science still does not know why we cry. I thought that was pretty obvious, but they don't know why, and here's why. Based on why you cry, your brain releases different chemicals in those tears. If, you, if it's a happy cry, you have different chemicals in those tears. If it's a cry of anger, you have different chemicals in those tears. If it's a cry of hurt, you have different chemicals. Why does the brain create different chemicals based on what's happened? They don't know. It's a big mystery. They're spending billions of dollars to figure out why we cry. Here's another thing. <laughs> I wish they'd figure this one. They don't know why we have hiccups. Any of you have ever had the hiccups? Oh, yeah, we get them, but they don't know why. I mean, there's a lot of hometown remedies to get rid of them, but they don't know how to get rid of them. Here's another thing. They don't know, get this. They don't know why certain animals will migrate once a year thousands of miles at times to the place they were born. They don't know why they do it, and they don't know how they figure out how to get back there. There's theories. Here's another thing. I thought this was in. They don't know why we sleep. Duh, I thought that was pretty obvious. But they say the body, the way it's made, technically doesn't need sleep. So why do we sleep? Here's another thing. They don't know why we dream. Any of you ever had some crazy dreams? <laughs> oh, yeah. They don't know why we dream. They can't figure that out. Okay? I was a pilot for years. Here's the one that got me. They don't know why we have turbulence. There are theories, but there's no formal explanation as why there's turbulence. Now, here's the second quote I want you to see by Bertrand Russell that applies to us today. He says, if you remove the question of God... The question of purpose of life is irrelevant. He, as an atheist, he says, you take God out of the equation, life has no meaning. There's no purpose in life. We live, we're born, we live, and we die, and that's it. We're just perpetuating an evolutionary process over and over, but to no good end. And if you go back and read the stuff he wrote, he says, the human nature and humanity of itself is very horrible. And he says, I don't understand why nature created us. We're the worst things on the planet. Well, of course, if you remove God from the equation, life is irrelevant. You don't have to be a scientist to see that, or a sociologist, or a psychologist, or a social worker, or law enforcement, to see that the world's getting worse. And I've been talking about this every week. And if you've missed any of them, you can go online. You can download the sermons along with the outline and the devotional guide that goes with them. And the whole point is, truth, how do we know it when we hear it? And so the question I want to ask today is, how did our culture get so confused? And what is the solution to this? And so I want us to learn from the absolute truth of God's word, the Bible, what is God's solution to this confused, messed up culture? And this is important for a lot of reasons, but the one I want to go with today is found in the a story that Jesus tells in Matthew chapter 7. He says this, 
everyone who hears my teaching and applies it to his life can be compared to a wise man who built his house on an unshakable foundation. When the rains fell and the flood came, with fierce winds beating upon his house, it stood firm because of its strong foundation. But everyone who hears my teaching and does not apply it to his life, well, he can be compared to a foolish man who built his house on sand. When it rained and rained and the flood came, with the wind and waves beating upon his house, it collapsed and was swept away, and great was its fall. Have you wondered why we, we take our kids to school and we take our kids to church, we put them in children's church, we raise them in youth group, and they go on these retreats, and, all, and then they get to college and they walk away? Has that ever bothered any of you? I mean, they've been in church all their life. Why did they walk away? Because we built their life on sand and not on a solid rock foundation. That's why. And they get caught up in school. They get caught up in the universities. They hear these people, these great PhDs, well-learned people, and they are persuaded by them. And so what I've discovered as I've been working on this series is our culture tends to treat the symptom to any problem rather than treat the problem itself. And that's, the, that's our culture's response. Uh, how many of you get weeds in your yard? We all get weeds. Have you ever noticed you don't have to plant those babies? They just grow. Now, I know people, they just mow over them. Well, the problem with mowing over them is what? They come right back. I want to pull them up by the roots and get rid of them. So today and next week, we're going to talk about how do we pull the symptom up by its root and get to the problem and the solution that God says is the solution to the problem. Okay? And I want to give you up front five, six, seven... <laughs> Solutions that our culture offers and the corresponding symptom they're trying to treat. But it fails every time. Here's the first solution. It's called a political solution. This solution says we just need to pass more laws and create more government policies. That's what it says. The truth is a lot of people genuinely believe that government, not God, is an answer to the human condition. That's socialism. That's Marxism. That's communism. Have you ever noticed, uh, I don't know if you know this, communism and socialism are the same thing. Have you noticed that Bernie Sanders, Ocasio-Cortez, never uses the word communism, they use the word what? Socialism. Because if they used the word communism, everybody would put up a red flag. And, we're, and in this series, we're going to get to looking at what socialism really is and why it goes against everything God wants on our planet. But they don't use the term communism. Karl Marx himself said, communism and socialism are identical. They are the same thing. I don't know about you, but I love my democracy. I don't want socialism, and I don't want communism. Hugo Chavez, when he took over as the dictator of Venezuela, Venezuela was the wealthiest nation in South America, the wealthiest nation in South America. But he nationalized everything under the auspices of, I'm making everybody equal. We're sharing the wealth. Do you know what the, I mean, they went from being the second wealthiest nation in the world behind us. They were 12 points ahead of China, 11 points ahead of other countries, four points against Japan. I'm trying to think off the top of my head because this is for a future sermon, but I'm giving it to you today because you'll probably forget it, and I'll, I'll remind you later, Okay. You know what the average worker in Venezuela makes today? Less than $1 a day. That's your socialism. That's your communism. And that's what Sanders wants. And that's what Ocasio-Cortez wants. And I will not have it in my country while I'm alive. I will not. This is why I want you to know what is going on. You need to know. You need to be informed. Because they're telling you something. And this younger generation is buying it up lock, stock, and barrel because they're promising them the world. No, they're promising them slavery. And in this series, I'm going to show you how many people Lenin murdered, Mayo murdered, Chavez murdered. You see, to implement socialism, you got to get rid of some people. you got to get rid of them. But our culture says politics is the answer. Government is the answer. You can call this salvation by legislation. This is salvation by legislation. Meaning the only way we're going to make a good change in our culture is by creating more laws. Now, a law can only 
force you to conform your behavior, not change your beliefs. And we've seen several prominent people get caught with this. Whoopi Goldberg is one. She didn't, this is what she really thinks about Jews. They're not a race. She really believes that. So now she's conformed her behavior to look like she's in compliance. But my question is, did it change in her heart? So we can legislate not using racist terms, but that doesn't stop you from being a racist. Because it has to have a change in the heart. There has never been a law that got rid of prejudice. There's never been a law that's dealt with anything like that that changed people's attitude. It changed their behavior. And we can create all the laws we want to change people's behavior, but it doesn't change what's in their heart. Here's your next fill-in for this. It is the belief that you use laws to change people's behavior. We just pass more laws, more government policies. We'll change people's behavior. We change the behavior, but that doesn't mean we've changed their heart. That's your political solution. Here's the second one our culture offers. It's called an academic solution. This solution says all the problems in the world are the result of ignorance. If we can just get everybody educated, get everybody taught, get everybody learned, we'd make the world a much better place. And, and for example, part of the goal of missions, if you've ever done mission work, is to eliminate illiteracy in the world. 90% of all the major universities around the world were started by Christians. Did you know that Harvard, Yale, and Princeton were started by pastors to train pastors? 90% of all the hospitals around the world were started by Christians. We're not against education. We're all for it. We're all for it. We believe in education. Hey, I went off. I got two masters that did doctor work. I'm not against education, but it's on our salvation. This is salvation by education. This is what you want to call it? This is what I call salvation by education. Did you know some of the worst tyrants in the world were some of the most educated people in the world? Osama bin Laden had two degrees. He attained a civil engineering degree in 1979 and a law degree in 1980, I mean a public administration degree in 1981. Vladimir Lenin, who turned Russia from capitalism into communism, he had a law degree. You can be educated, you can still be a tyrant. You see, they don't get to the problem, they just try to treat the symptom. It is the belief that you use learning to change people's knowledge. If we can train people, we can get them learned, we can change the world. I'm not against that. I've learned a lot in my lifetime that has benefited me about taking care of the environment, and taking care of the, I'm all for this stuff, okay? But it's not, it's just the symptom. It's not treating the problem. Here's a third solution our culture offers to the problems we're in today. I call it a financial solution. This solution sees everything in the world in economic terms. It is a belief that we just need to put more money, more money, more money, more money, more money, more money into the system. Now, economics matters. I know it does. It matters to you. Many of you have retirement accounts you're living on. Economics is important. We need to understand money and how it works and how we can make it work for us. Okay? But that doesn't hit the root of the problem. I call this um, salvation by compensation. Do you realize what all those stimulus checks have done to our national debt? Do you know why inflation is high? Because we were led to buy life. We just put more money into it. Our lives are better. And now what's happening? We're at 7.5% inflation. Aren't you glad you got your stimulus checks? See, that's the government's approach. Let's just throw more money into it. Let's throw more money into it. They don't tell you the downside of this picture. And globally, there are two approaches to dealing with this. And they're opposite approaches. The first approach I've already mentioned, socialism. It basically says we're going to take all the money and put it in the one pool and we'll redistribute it equally. And we're going to take a little bit of yours and a little bit of mine. We're going to mix it all up and give it to everybody. But when you go back and you study these people who promise this, Chavez, Fidel Castro, Mao Zedong, Lenin, they don't do that. That's what I told you a few weeks ago. The elite intellectuals who advocate this are the ones at the top who benefit from this. The rest of us pay a price for it. But that's one solution. They advocate socialism. The second one is the one I like, capitalism. This is we believe in the free market enterprise. 
we believe in entrepreneurship. We do believe in education, but we believe that you get to choose what kind of job you want to have, negotiate what salary and the benefits you're going to have, okay? It is the belief that you use money and materialism to change what people have. That's what it is. You use money and materialism to change what people have. Ha ha isn't it interesting what these socialists promise this younger generation? They promise them the world. They promise them everything. We'll give you money, we'll give you materialism, because we want you to have more and more and more. And here's, here's what data shows. Every time people get a raise, you know what they do with that money? They don't save it. What do they do with it? They spend it. We can give everybody a billion dollars in this country. And within a few months, most of them are going to be broke. Do you know that 92% of the people who win lotteries file bankruptcy later? You can give people all the money you want. If they don't know how to handle it, what good is it? But our culture is, let's just give them more money. Throw more money into the pot. Here's a, another solution our culture offers that just treats the symptom but not the real problem. I call it the psychological solution. This solution sees everything in the world in terms of emotional terms. Feelings. I think there was a song. Feelings. If we can just get people to feel differently about themselves and about the world, about their past and about the future, we'll be better off. I call this, based on uh, if you took a basic psychology course, I put this in your devotional uh, for this week, uh, Maslow's Principles of Self-Actualization. It's salvation by self-actualization. We're going to help you actualize what's going on in your life. And once you can feel that and get in touch with that, you're going to be a whole lot better for it. You're going to have less stress. You're going to have more happiness. Okay? It's the belief that you use self-enlightenment to change what people feel. That's what it is. I'm not against psychology. It's a wonderful field. But it's not our salvation. It treats symptoms. It never treats the problem. Here's another solution our culture offers. I call it the sociological solution. This says that all we need to do is change the social structures in society and all will be well. And at the beginning of the 20th century, we saw this on a grand scale with a lot of tyrants, Lenin, Mayo, and others began to change the social stratas in those countries. Okay? And they kept promising their people they would be better off for it. And in the 20th century, we've had more people die from this kind of philosophy than ever in the history of the world. One of the ways that Hitler knew he could change the world was by changing the social stratus of Jews. We annihilate them, we're better off for it. It was a sociological approach to dealing with people. You can call this salvation by association. It is a belief that you use new social designs or social groups to change how people relate. And there's nothing wrong in us being part of groups. I mean, if I ask some of you, how many of you went to Hoggard, you raise your hand. How many of you went to Hanover, you raise your hand. How many of you went to some other high school in some other state? There's nothing wrong with that. We, we had to have social groups to intermingle, to grow, to mature. There's nothing wrong with it. But it's how they want to use them. They treat the symptom. They don't ever treat the real problem. In fact, being part of a church is a social group. There's nothing wrong in this. But again, they treat the solution and not the problem. Here's the sixth approach our culture uses. I call it a biological solution. This says all we need to do is change how we can create the perfect human body. Billions of dollars are being spent now on learning how to create the perfect body. Scientists are studying genes. They're studying in DNA. They're studying uh, all kind of gene mapping. How can we uh, take genes and reconfigure them? For example, if you have O positive or O negative blood, you're not totally immune to COVID, but you're basically immune to it. And now they're trying to figure out those who have O type blood, why do they rarely ever get COVID? It's like their body's immune to it. I'm not opposed to us trying to figure that out and try to come up with something in a future vaccine that may make us all immune to it. But that's not their point. They're striving for the perfect human being, perfect human body. Okay? It is the belief science has appeal for every problem. In other words, you can call this salvation by medicine, technology, and by innovation. You got a problem with this? Oh, we got a pill for you. 
I mean, when you go to the doctor and something's wrong, and he says, I'm going to write you a prescription, you go, oh, no, no. Oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just fine without your pills. No, most of us go, thank you. We have bought this lie that society can provide us a pill for every problem in our life. Most of that helps, but a lot of it just treats the symptom and not the real problem, okay? It is the belief that you can create new bodies to change how healthy people live. There's a whole industry out there called cryonics. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's a process by when you got some fatal disease, there's not a cure for it. The moment you die, they freeze your body. They freeze you. Boom. They stick you in this little tube. And the hope is that whenever they find a cure for this disease, they will bring you back and give you the treatment for it, and you will live another whatever. One of the most famous people to do this is one of the most famous baseball players, Ted Williams. He played for the Boston Red Sox. And when he died in 2002, I mean, 2002, yes, his body was immediately frozen, put in a cryogenic freeze in anticipation that one day when they find the cure for his heart disease, they'll be able to revive him, bring him back, and he'll go on to live again. I'm waiting to see how many of you are ready to invest in that one. The Bible says when we're dead, we're gone. We're gone. We're not coming back. But a lot of people who have a lot of wealth are spending billions of dollars to keep their bodies or their loved ones' bodies frozen until there's a cure for that disease. Why? Because we are striving for the perfect human body. Have you noticed how much emphasis our culture puts on looks? Tummy tucks, liposuction. All this stuff. We, we want to all look like a model. And our Hollywood celebrities, everybody emphasizes this. There's all these magazines out there that young girls get into and they get caught up into it. That tells them, hey, here's how you get to the perfect body. Well, all of these treat the symptom. They don't treat the problem. Let me give you one that treats the problem. I call it a, a biblical solution. The problem in our culture is not political, it's not educational, it's not financial, it's not material, it's not psychological, sociological, and it's not biological. This view, this solution says that what we need to do is create a new person through a, through a change of the heart, and you can call this salvation by God's transformation. God changes the heart. Once the heart gets changed, then everything else falls into place. God specializes in doing this. I have seen God take some of the most prejudiced, racist people and turn them into some of the most loving, accepting people in the world. Only God can do that. There's no law that can do that. I've seen God take some of the most meanest, unkind people, turn them into some of the most loving, accepting, encouraging people in the world. Only God can do that. It's salvation by transformation. In the book of Proverbs, the writer says this. Above all else, guard your heart because it's the wellspring of life. Now, all these other six, they just treat the symptom. They don't go to the root of the problem. God goes to the root of the problem. He says, it's in the wellspring of your heart. Your heart's what's wrong. We get your heart right, then everything else falls into place. And when you look at the world, the heart of a problem is really a problem of the heart. You see that? When you look at the world... The heart of the problem is a problem of the heart. We're fallen sinners. That's what we are. And until we allow God to bring about a transformation of our heart, nothing is going to help. All we'll be doing is treating the symptoms. I read about this story where this um, father uh, was home for the day with his son. School was out. And it, they had made all these plans to go out and do stuff. But it, it just stormed all day, so they couldn't get outside. And his young son got bored. So the father was coming up with all kinds of creative ways to keep the son occupied. And um, he found this uh, map inside of this magazine. He ripped it out. And he ripped the map up into all kinds of different pieces, big pieces, small pieces. And he took them into his son's room. He says, look, put this map back together. I'm going to time you. See how fast you can get it done. So his son took up the challenge. And within minutes, he had it done. So his father shocked. He couldn't believe it. So when he walks back in, he says, Dad, I'm done. I got the map together. He goes, it's all taped. Everything's just right. He said, Son, how in the world did you do that so quickly? He says, well, on the back of the map was a picture of a man. When I got the man put together, the world fit in. See, that's God. When he gets the man right, everything else fits in. 
But our culture treats the symptom, not the problem. It starts in our heart. The fact is, only change hearts can change the world. Only change people can change the world. But we live in a world that applies solutions that treat symptoms and not the problem. And as a result of that, you'll see in the rest of your notes, I believe it's created what I call five spiritual heart diseases. Okay? And these spiritual heart diseases, the world doesn't treat, but God does. So today, I'm going to give you what these spiritual heart diseases are, and next week, we're going to look at God's solution to treating the problem to this. All right? Here's the first one we have to deal with, all of us. Guilt. How many of you have ever felt guilty? <laughs> we all do. None of us are perfect. We all blow it. There have been times, I know none of you have ever done this, ever. Come into church, have an argument in the car. None of you have ever done that, have you? I mean, you're just going out. And then you pull in, you get out, and there's the greeters. How are you doing? We're doing just great. We've had a great week. How's your week been? Liar, liar, pants on fire. Okay? Guilt. We all blow it. We all mess up. You can't be happy and guilty at the same time. They cancel out each other. It's impossible to feel good and to feel bad at the same time. Many people live with this, and the symptom is a feeling of worthlessness. And I imagine there are times in your life you have felt worthless for whatever reason. Somebody made you feel worthless, or you did something that made you feel worthless. David writes in Psalm 40, 12, I was so swamped by guilt, I couldn't see my way clear. I had more guilt in my heart than hair on my head. Now, for some of you men, that's not too hard, is it, okay? And the guilt was so heavy that my heart gave out. Well, when we're in trouble, we often say, I have a heavy heart. My heart is burdened. David, reflecting back on when he sinned with Bathsheba and the murder of his best friend and personal bodyguard Uriah, he was so overwhelmed with guilt, he said, my heart just gave out. You can't feel good and guilty at the same time. And as a result, it creates a sense of worthlessness. I read this week of a in Minersville, Pennsylvania. I don't know where that is. Minersville, Pennsylvania. A man cleared his conscience by paying a 44-year-old parking ticket. The Minersville Police Department received a letter in 2018 with a $5 bill and a note inside. The return address was, quote, feeling guilty, wayward road, any town, California. He didn't know where he, he was. The police chief, Michael Combs, told local news, he said, this is what the note said. Dear police department, I've been carrying this ticket around for 40 plus years, feeling guilty and worthless. Always intending to pay, forgive me, I, I, I never did it. I'm not giving you my info, because I don't want you to come and get me. With respect, Dave. In 1974, that ticket was only $2. He added three for interest. And the police chief said, because back then they didn't have the technology to track things, he said, we'd have to go through paperwork after paperwork, going way back in the archives to figure out who this guy was. It doesn't, wasn't worth the time. But he'd been carrying this for 44 years, the guilt of not paying that ticket. Here's the second heart disease that occurs because we treat the symptom and not the problem. Compulsions. There are things in your life you know that are not good for you to do, and you do them anyway. You know there are things in your life you know you should do, but you don't do them anyway. Another word for this is addiction. Everyone in this room has some kind of addiction or addictions. All of us do. There are compulsions. Things we know we should do, we don't do it, or things we know we shouldn't do that we do. For example, every one of us in this room know that we should be exercising. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but how many of you exercise on a regular basis? All of us in this room know we should eat right. But most of us don't. We know what we should do, but we don't do it. Why? Because of compulsions. That addiction. There are times we say, I want to change, but I don't. I wish I didn't do this, but I do. And that's just the way life is. And this heart disease has its own symptom. The symptom is people have a feeling of helplessness. I'm never going to be free from this. I'm never going to get beyond this. Not only do they feel worthless because of guilt, 
they feel helpless because of their compulsions and addictions. And, and when I love the scriptures, I love that it's very honest. The Apostle Paul battled his own compulsions, his own addiction. He writes about them in Romans 7. Here's what he says. What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another, doing things I absolutely despise. Now, this is the great Apostle Paul who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. So if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's command is necessary. But I need something more. In other words, he's saying just because I know the right thing to do is not enough in making me doing the right thing. He says, I'm powerless. He says, for if I know the law, meaning God's rules, but I still can't keep it, and if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I don't have what it takes. Could it will it? I, I want to I will it, but I don't do it. For example, don't raise your hand. How many of you would say, I, I know I need to go on a diet. I heard, don't look at them. I saw some of you going, not me, but... You know you need to go on a diet, but you don't do it. You know you shouldn't be putting all that sugar in your body, but you do it. You know you should be getting adequate rest, but you don't do it. You have your excuses, you have your reasons. You want to do it, but you don't do it. Look what he says in verse 19. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. Or I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. Anybody relate to this? My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. In fact, over 90 plus percent of New Year's resolutions die within the first two weeks, they say. He says, something has gone wrong deep within me. Again, it's a heart problem. And it gets the better of me every time. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's command and others. I want to do what God wants. I want to obey Him. I want to love Him. I know the things I want. I should be doing that are right. I know the things I shouldn't be doing, but I'm doing. That's, I want to honor God. But He says, I don't always do this. He said, I truly delight in God's commands, but it is obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me covertly rebel, and just when I least expect it, they take charge. I've tried everything, but nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? In other words, how can I change? And that's the real question. And then he concludes with this. The answer, thank God, is biology. Thank God it's education. Thanks God it's politics. Thank God it's money. Is that what he says? No, he says, thank God it's what? Jesus Christ. The solution to every problem is Jesus. It's not the government. It's not education. It's not money. It's not sociology. It's not psychology. It's not biology. It's theology. Jesus Christ is the answer to every. I read about a man who purchased a white mouse to use as food for his pet snake. He would drop the unsuspecting mouse into the snake's glass cage where the snake was sleeping in a bed of sawdust. The tiny mouse had a serious problem on his hands. Obviously, the mouse needed to come up with a brilliant plan to stay alive. What did the little terrified creature do? He quickly set to, cut, set to work covering the snake with sawdust chips until it was completely buried under them. With that, the mouse apparently thought he had solved his problem. The solution, however, came from the outside. The man took pity on the silly little mouse and removed him from the cage. No matter how hard we try to cover up or deny our sinful nature, it's still there, folks. It's still there. And if it's not for the saving grace of Jesus Christ, we're still nothing but a mouse inside of the cage with a snake. Jesus is the answer. Here's the third spiritual heart disease that that has occurred with us trying to treat the symptoms and not the problem. Alienation. Many people live with a feeling of disconnectedness. They feel disconnected from spouses, disconnected from their children, disconnected from friends, disconnected from family, disconnected in all kinds of ways. Where they sit back and go, I just don't understand you. I, I don't get you. I, I don't know what's going on with you. And as a result, there's this wall of alienation that comes up between all of us. The symptom of this heart disease is, is an overwhelming feeling of loneliness. Remember that song, One? 
is what? Loneliest number in the world. Most people have never experienced genuine intimacy in their life, soul to soul, heart to heart, genuine companionship. People feel separated. They feel detached today. Paul writes this in Colossians 1.21. He says this, Once you were alienated from God, and you were enemies in your mind because of your evil behavior. See, in America, we value the spirit of independence so much that we've created the greatest generation of disconnected people ever. There are a lot of lonely people out there today. A lot of them are married. A lot of them are single. But it's a heart problem. Studies have shown that loneliness is on the rise in our country. From 2014 to 2017, Vice Admiral Vivek Murdy served as the 19th Surgeon General of the United States. He writes this, We live in the most technologically connected age in the history of civilization, yet rates of loneliness have doubled since the 1980s. Today, over 50% of adults in America report feeling lonely, and research suggests that the real number is a lot higher. Additionally, the number of people who report having a close confidant in their lives has been declining over the past decades. Loneliness and weak social connections are associated with a reduction in lifespan similar to that caused by smoking 15 cigarettes a day and even greater than associated with obesity. Did you hear what he said? Because we're disconnected. That's worse than smoking 15 cigarettes a day and being obese. He says, but we haven't focused nearly as much effort on strengthening connections between people as we have on curbing tobacco use or obesity. Loneliness is also associated with the greater risk of cardiovascular disease, dementia, depression, and anxiety. At work, loneliness pr reduces task performance, limits creativity, impairs other aspects of executive functions, such as reasoning and decision making. For our health and our work, it is imperative that we address the loneliness because it's at an epidemic stage. In fact, the government has done its own study of ages 13 to 38, the most connected group in this country. They're connected through texting, Instagram, Spotify, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, what's up, you know, all those social things out there. And yet, these 13 to 38-year-olds in all the surveys say they are the most loneliest group of people on the planet. But yet, they have all this technology to stay connected, but they're not. We keep treating the symptom and not the problem. Here's a fourth spiritual heart disease that comes from just treating symptoms and not problems. Confusion. This is the heart that creates a feeling of uncertainty, and the symptom is a aimlessness. In other words, I don't really know what I'm supposed to do. I don't know what I'm really supposed to be going. I'm just drifting through life. I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know what the meaning of life is. And I, get, I just don't know. And so we just go from this to this to this to this. I tell you all the time, you were created by God and for God. Until that sinks in, life's not going to make sense. God created you with a unique, individualized purpose. It's just for you and no one else. And in class 301, I go over this. I help you narrow down what is God's purpose for your life. I use an acrostic called shape. Okay? God's purpose for your life has to do with shape. Your spiritual gifts. Your heart, in other words, what, you, what, what makes you come alive? What do you enjoy doing? A, your abilities. P, your personality. I give you a personality test. And E, your experiences. Mainly, we look at your painful experiences. And the longer you've been a follower of Jesus Christ, the more you should be aware of what your spiritual shape is and what God's purpose for you. And if you don't know what that is, that tells me a lot right there. You're just drifting. You're just existing. You're not really living. You just get up in the morning. You get cleaned up. You eat something, you go to work, you come home, you watch the TV, and you go to bed. But there's no sense of significance, no sense of meaning. It's just the same old thing day in and day out. Southside, that's not living. That's existing. And the reason I asked you to take class 301 is so that you can learn your God-given purpose, and it will make you come alive like you have never been alive before. Jesus, when he looked out on the crowds, had this sense of compassion for how confused and aimless they were. It says this in Matthew 9, 36. Jesus looked out over the crowds. His heart broke for them. Why? Because they were so confused and what? 
aimless like sheep with no shepherd. They were confused and they were aimless. That's not just a 21st century problem. It's been the problem ever since sin came into the world. God has a problem for that. We'll look at it next week. Here's the fifth spiritual heart disease that occurs because we just treat symptoms. We don't treat the problem. Uh, Y'all going to love this one. Worry. Anybody married to a worry wart? Don't look at them. Don't look at them. Don't look at them. I've had people tell me, I've got a PhD in worry. Oh, that's something to brag about. Okay. That's really good. I'm glad. Worry. Why is it in a country where we have everything at our disposal, Americans are the most anxious, worrying people on the planet? Do you have any idea? I'll tell you later how much money we spend. Spend it sounds real southern. How much money we spend on anxiety medication and this kind of stuff? Because we want to treat the symptom and not the problem. I'm not opposed to people having medicine. Don't misunderstand me. But I think our solution is to take a pill first rather than turn to prayer. We want a pill rather than pray. I believe Jesus Christ is the answer to even your anxiety, your worry. And the symptom of this spiritual heart disease of worry is hopelessness. It's hopelessness. David felt hopeless at times. In Psalm 55, 2, he says this, My faults are restless, and I am confused. In Proverbs 12, 25, it says this, Worry weighs a person down. Any of you ever been weighed down at night while you're trying to sleep? I mean, it's just on your mind. You can't sleep. You, you can't rest. You, you get up, and you walk around, and you go do something. But it's still there. You try to distract yourself with something else. But all of a sudden, in the moments where you quiet down, there it is. It's right back in your face, just pounding you, pounding you, beating you down weighing you down, giving you a sense of hopelessness. The paraphrased version puts it this way. Worry and anxiety causes a person to have depression and hopelessness. You can't be happy and depressed at the same time. Worry weighs a person down. I found this interesting. According to our nation's Bureau of Standards, a dense fog covering seven city blocks to a depth of 100 feet from the ground up 100 feet up, all the way down to the ground, seven city blocks. You know how much water that actually is? It's not enough to fill one eight-ounce drinking glass. But isn't it amazing how much that fog shuts down your visibility? You can't see in it. You have to slow way down if you're driving to make your way through it. And like fog, our worries can thoroughly block our vision to the light of God's promises that create hopelessness in us but there's really very little substance in them. Research has been done about the things we worry about. Here they are, Dr. Walter Calvert of the National Science Foundation. Here's what he discovered. 40% of our worries are about things that never, ever happen. Never. Meaning, of your top 10 worries, you can throw out four of them right now. Boop. <laughs> 30% of your worries concern the past. Think about that. You're worrying about 40% things that will never happen, 30% they are already in the past. It's over. You need to move on. As my little niece used to say in her little three-year-old voice, hop along, little doggy. 12% of our worries are about unfounded health issues. It's like the hypochondriac who had written on his tombstone, I told you I was sick. 10% of our worries are about trivial and insignificant issues. Only 8% of the things you worry about are legitimate concerns. But you focus on the 92% and it weighs you down. It drags you down. It steals your life. It steals the joy of your salvation. South side, listen to me. Let the joy of the Lord be your strength. Not worry. And I know this morning you've come here with all kinds of issues that are weighing you down. I'm not negating that. Don't misunderstand me. They are important. But don't let worry run the roost. Let Jesus Christ be the joy of your salvation. Many of you recognize the name of Corrie Ten Boone. She was put in a Nazi concentration camp called Ravensbrück because she and her family had hidden Jews in a hiding place in her home. Here's what she says about worry. Worrying is carrying tomorrow's load with today's strength. Carrying two days at once. It is moving into tomorrow ahead of time. 
Worry doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. Author Somers Roach says this, Worry is a thin stream of fear trickling through the mind. It encourages, it cuts a channel into which all other thoughts are drained. Now, on your outline, you'll see on these spiritual heart disease, a little line before each number, one, two, three, four, five. Here's what I want you to do as we get ready to go into our time of reflection with God. Which of these have you either struggled with in the past or you're struggling with today? Be honest with yourself. Be honest with God. And what I want you to do is covenant with God today to start looking at God's solution to the problem rather than buying the lie of the fixing the symptom that our culture offers. So Southside Truth, how do you know it? When you hear it, let's pray.